Welkom bij de elfde en tevens de allerlaatste lezing alweer van de CD informatiereeks Israël in het Midden-Oosten. Uh, gisteren hebben we natuurlijk de verkiezingen in Israël gehad. Uh, daar uh, hebben we gisteravond een verkiezingsavond over georganiseerd met uh, Michal Kotlerunch. Die uh, Dat kunt u terugkijken op de CD website. En daar kunt u ook natuurlijk ook updates vinden over de Israëlische verkiezingen. Uh, maar vandaag voor de informatiereeks gaan we het ergens anders over hebben, namelijk over de Israëlische veiligheidsoverwegingen ten aanzien van de Palestijnse gebieden. Denk aan de Gazastrook en de west jordaan oever En hiervoor hebben we een zeer speciale gast, kolonel in de reservedienst uh, Grisha Jakubovic. Hij heeft uh, meer dan 30 jaar uh, bij het Israëlische leger gezeten op verschillende posities. Uh, waaronder uh, belangrijke posities voor onderhandelingen en bemiddelingen. Uh, en uiteindelijk was hij ook uh, hoofd van de civiele afdeling van de coördinatie van overheidsactiviteiten in de territoria. Ook wel bekend als COGAT. Uh, Mr. Jakubovic, I would like to give the floor to you. Oké, okay, first of all, good morning from Israel. We are after a long day of elections yesterday. Um, we don't know yet who is going to be the prime minister and what government we are going to face because it will uh, automatically impact on the relations between Israel and the Palestinians. Okay, so we are going to talk about Gaza and the West Bank and what's in between. Now, I'm saying what in between or the title is what's in between because usually people believe or think that there is nothing between Gaza and the West Bank. And I would like to, uh, to explain uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, geographically, the distance between the closer points between Gaza and the West Bank is something like 40 kilometers. So it's two geographical areas disconnected from each other with a distance of minimum 40 kilometers. And uh, we will we will we will enter uh, to uh, to uh, the reality inside and who is controlling what in a minute but just physically what i would like to clarify that although gaza and the west bank are two different geographical areas they are connected through the israeli systems and i would like to uh, uh, to explain what is the meaning of that people usually think that israel supplies all the the amount of water to the Gaza Strip. Well, this is not the reality. Israel supplies only 10% of the water needed in Gaza that the people there are using. It's not that Israel has a, a problem to supply more. This is a decision that must be taken. Uh, one of the uh, players is the Palestinian Authority because they will need to pay for that. But Israel supplies the water to the Gaza Strip, only 10% with the Israeli network. Israel supplies also some water, actually more than to Gaza, to the West Bank. And it's the same uh, pipes, it's the, it's the same network. So actually, the same water, or the same network, the same pipes that are, are actually connecting the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And the same thing is with uh, electricity. Israel supplies 43% of the electricity to the Gaza Strip with the Israeli grid. And Israel supplies the electricity to the West Bank. It's the same grid, it's the same poles, it's the same everything. So actually there is a connection and the same thing is with telecommunication and with uh, access and movement uh, uh, through the crossing and etc. So this is something I wanted to clarify uh, as, a, as a beginning and of course the economy. Uh, the goods, all the goods, all the, all, the majority of the goods that are entering to Gaza are goods that people from Gaza are buying from Israeli uh, factories. The same thing is also in the West Bank. Uh, as of today, I retired uh, five years ago, four and a half years ago, and I'm a consultant to the biggest cement company in Israel. And I... Uh, by being a consultant, I'm the, I'm the manager of the Palestinian market. So I have 327 clients, factories, okay, C uh, concrete factories in the West Bank that I'm supplying them the cement directly. So they will be able to build uh, the cities and the houses and, and whatever in the West Bank. I have also clients in the Gaza Strip. 
Unfortunately, I cannot enter to Gaza because it's, a, it's an area controlled by a terror organization, Hamas, but I'm supplying cement, uh, more than uh, almost 1,000 tons a day to uh, clients that I have in the Gaza Strip. So they are buying the cement from Israeli companies and I'm one of them. Uh, so uh, it's electricity, it's water, it's communication, it's economy that uh, the supply, not, not 100%, but it comes uh, from Israel. Uh, I wanna start with a short timeline uh, and I'm not here in this lecture uh, or webinar to teach you all history. Uh, but uh, I do want to mention uh, two dates that are not mentioned here. It's First of all, it's 2005. In 2005, Israel uh, disengaged from the Gaza Strip. So since 2005, September, the disengagement was completed. There were no more settlements inside the Gaza Strip. So the Gaza Strip up here is an area of 365 square kilometers uh, controlled only by the Palestinians. In 2006, there were elections at the Palestinian Authority. By the way, the last elections in the Palestinian Authority uh, existed or happened in 2006, and only in 2021, now, this year, Mahmoud Abbas declared about another round of elections. While in any democratic country, uh, not in Israel, in Israel we have elections uh, uh, four times in two years, but uh, uh, usually elections are uh, once in three, four or five years in, in any other democratic uh, country. Uh, 2007, and this is where I want to start the timeline and why 2007. In 2006, Hamas actually in a way won the elections. Because of this fact, Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas decided to establish a unity government. Hamas were disappointed from what they got in this unity government. And this disappointment led to the implementation of a strategic plan that they had is to conquer the Gaza Strip from the unity government, from Fatah. So in June 2007, the, uh, the ground, there was an earthquake, let's say in Gaza. Hamas conquered the Gaza Strip by force from the uh, unity government from Fatah. Fatah officials ran to the borders and we saved their lives. Uh, I would prefer not to uh, say names of people because I don't want to embarrass them. Uh, and 300 Fatah officials were captured by Hamas and executed in Gaza. They tied their hands in the back, they shot them in the knees and they threw them down from high strong buildings. From that moment on, Hamas took responsibility on the Gaza Strip. Uh, I want to clarify another small uh, point that is very important, but because of the fact that the Palestinian Authority and Hamas established a unity government in 2006, for Israel, it was a big no-no. It means how can we coordinate with the government that some of the ministers are painted green and they are actually Hamas. This is a terror organization. So Israel stopped all coordination, civil coordination and security coordination with the Palestinian Authority. From June 2007, after Hamas conquered uh, or Hamas cop in the Gaza Strip uh, and Hamas actually were not part of this government, Israel got back to the traditional coordination, civil and security coordination, but only in the West Bank. So since June 2007, the, we are talking about two different Palestinian entities. One is Hamas, a terror entity that controls the Gaza Strip, and two PA, Palestinian Authority Fatah, that are controlling uh, the West Bank with two different timelines, with two different uh, series of events that happened in Gaza and in the West Bank. I want to start with the Gaza Strip and what happened there. Hamas took responsibility. So from that moment on, they are the government in the Gaza Strip. Now for Israel, the policy that was implemented towards the Gaza Strip was a very simple one. It says it's Hamas, it's a terror entity. They are launching rockets into Israel. They are implementing terror attacks. They are digging tunnels. 
Uh, we already knew that tunnels exist since 2006, 2007. They were discovered only in 2009, 2010, officially. And uh, so the policy was very simple. Why, what, what does Israel owe this terror organization? We owe them nothing. So uh, the policy, and I will try to uh, wrap it in, in, in one sentence, uh, nothing is allowed to be entered to Gaza except what they need. So if their needs is that they will eat potatoes, then they will get only potatoes from Israel. If their needs that they need only diesel, that they need diesel, so Israel will uh, allow to only, let's say, 24,000 liters of diesel a day, that it will serve only ambulances, uh, uh, fire trucks, and, and things like that. It's like Israel says, we owe you nothing. We don't owe you diesel that you will force buy, or we don't want to sell it to you that you will operate the trucks that will launch the rockets into Israel. If you want to find diesel for those trucks, so go and bring it from somewhere else. You don't have to do it from Israel. And the same thing is with electricity. It's like, we will supply you electricity, but we don't owe you or more than what we are supplying already. And our intention is to stop supplying that in the future. So find yourself other options of electricity or, 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 or power uh, because Hamas they are using the same electricity to dig the tunnels or to build the rocket that eventually they will launch into Israel. So, by the way, it's a dilemma. Would you, in Netherlands, supply electricity to somebody that uses the same electricity as a dual use? Once for people, you know, for hospitals, and on the other hand, to build, I don't know, weapons or, or rockets that will try and destroy you. So it's a building dilemma, by the way, till today, a building dilemma of what should Israel do with uh, such a reality. Hamas understanding that they will not change the reality in Gaza. Now they uh, conquered Gaza. They need to show the people that they have achievements. So they launched Operation Cast Lead to change the reality. It didn't help them. What actually helped them is a small event in 2010, the flotilla from uh, Marmara and the ghost on report. So, this flotilla and the operation and the Gosun report all together uh, pushed Israel to the corner with uh, uh, a lot of uh, criticism, by the way, on, on Israel's policy. Uh, and Israel decided to change the policy in 2010 from a policy that says nothing is allowed to be entered to Gaza except what they need to a policy that says Everything is allowed to be entered to Gaza except dual use materials. Dual use materials are materials that can be used for civil needs and for terror needs. For example, um, uh, fertilizer. Okay, a fertilizer is um, very much needed in Gaza uh, to irrigate the field, so they will double the amount of vegetables that they grow inside Gaza but the same fertilizer used as a device. And uh, they succeeded to uh, attack three Israeli tanks. By the way, I've seen that personally on the border. Three Israeli tanks were actually f f flew in the air when the other side, Hamas, used this fertilizer uh, to bomb them or to explode them. Uh, so Israel expanded the civil policy. And uh, I want to stop here between 2011 and 12 a little bit and to explain uh, another fact. Uh, some things happened in Egypt. And in Egypt, there was uh, El Tahrir Square demonstrations. Mubarak uh, was taken to prison and later on elections. And who won the elections in Egypt? The Muslim Brotherhood. Now, what I want to uh, clarify is that Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas is actually the same thing. Hamas were established in Al Azhar University in Egypt on the knees of the Muslim Brotherhood by Sheikh Ahmad Yassin. And he brought all the uh, philosophy from there and implemented that in Gaza. So for Hamas, it was like a dream that came true that for the first time they are backed from the Egyptian side by Muslim Brotherhood. It's their allies. It's like they felt like we have our big mama behind us to support us. So that, that's the reality, uh, the political reality between Israel, Gaza, and, uh, and Egypt. So in 2012, Israel decided to uh, kill uh, Hamas chief of staff, Hamad al-Jabri. Uh, a missile was launched 
uh, and after many years, uh, he was he was Israel killed him. He had a lot of blood on his hand, and because of this fact, Operation Pillar of Defense uh, started. It lasted only two weeks, not more than that. Uh, Israel did not enter to the Gaza Strip, and we were asked. By the way, we were asked by the way not to enter to Gaza. And we were asked by the Muslim Brotherhood to fly to Egypt and to negotiate uh, about ceasefire. I was very lucky to be a member in one of the teams. So I led one of the five negotiation teams and we agreed what we agreed, uh, a ceasefire and that we would spend the civil policy uh, more than we did in 2010. And we implemented that and everything went smooth and nice. Uh, Hamas continued with the rockets. We uh, continued with the expanded civil policy uh, and everybody were happy but uh, a small change happened is between on is, is on the border between egypt and gaza uh, the muslim brotherhood actually supported uh, what i define as the tunnel economy it means more than one thousand tunnels were operated by hamas between gaza and in Egypt to smuggle all the goods. Now, uh, Egypt could not allow themselves to do it officially on the ground. Okay, there is a crossing between Gaza and Egypt because there are some agreements that Egypt signed on and they are not allowed to operate the crossing uh, just like that. It must be agreed by the EU, by Israel, by uh, the PA, uh, by Egypt. So uh, Hamas smuggled uh, all the goods it's not only the good, it's also the weapon. If you just go back to history and check, there was also riots in Libya, a coup in Libya, a civil war in Libya, Gaddafi was killed, and all the warehouses with all the weapons that, Hama, that Libya had actually were opened to sell, and they sold everything, and everything was smuggled through Egypt into Gaza. Uh, by the way, you can see the amount of rockets in 2012 that were launched and the amount of rockets that were launched in 2014. And this is actually the, the big jump of all the rockets that were smuggled into Gaza uh, through Egypt using those tunnels. Now, uh, I forgot to mention one, one fact is when you operate tunnels, you make money. And who made the money is Hamas. So Hamas taxed all the goods that were smuggled into Gaza through those tunnels and they made an income of something like... 350 million dollars a year only by taxing those goods that were smuggled into Gaza. I asked them and we should all ask them is where is the money? Uh, they could use this money, this huge amount of millions of dollars to build schools, clinics and, 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 and other issues, but they preferred to invest the money in paying salaries and in buying weapons and develop uh, new weapons, new rockets, new uh, drones, etc., uh, etc. Et I'm not here to talk about uh, security and all those things, but just to explain the reality. Uh, June 2013, another change, another coup in Gaza, and this time uh, Assisi uh, takes control in Egypt. Now, Assisi uh, implemented a total different policy than Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood, and he decided to close all the tunnels between Gaza and Egypt. By the way, he did quite a good job. Now, if you close the tunnels, you stop the flow of cash. It means Hamas have no more, no longer uh, $350 million a year, and they cannot pay salaries to their officials that they appointed, that Mahmoud Abbas, the president in the West Bank, refuses to accept them as PA officials. So uh, 30,000 Hamas officials are doing the job, but they don't get money. On the other hand, 70,000 officials that are PA officials that were fired when Hamas conquered the Gaza Strip are sitting home and continue getting the money from the PA in Ramallah to the banks. Now, this is uh, one event that impacted the second event that impacted is the uh, economical crisis that Assisi, Egypt, led actually uh, in Gaza. Because if you close the tunnels and you stop the flow of cash and you stop the flow of goods, it means all the goods that you need to buy now are goods that are coming only from Israel. I don't know who uh, visited Israel lately, but uh, everything here is very, very unfortunately expensive. So if uh, during the tunnel economy, uh, somebody from Gaza could buy a bag of flour 
20 kilos or 30 kilos in, let's say, uh, 50 shekels. Now, when it comes from Israel, the same bag of flour will cost three times more, 150 shekels. So a huge inflation uh, inside the Gaza Strip. Combination of all of that, and let's add to that a water crisis, an electricity crisis, a sewage crisis, an economical crisis, no way to pay the salaries, and three kids that were kidnapped in the West Bank by Hamas and brutally murdered, all of that led to protect to Operation Protective Edge in 2014. The longest operation ever that Israel led uh, with an enemy with more than 4,000 rockets that were launched into Israel. Uh, uh, this operation lasted something like, if I remember correctly, 52 days. And since then, uh, we are in a reality that Hamas, uh, we negotiated that also, by the way, I forgot to mention, I flew to New York, my commander flew to Egypt, I, he did that from uh, Egypt, I did it from New York with, uh, with the UN, with Ban Ki-moon and other people, I'm still not allowed to mention a few of the things, unfortunately. Uh, but as you can understand, uh, there was a good negotiation. Uh, I have a, an article prepared uh, that uh, I'm waiting uh, that it will be authorized by the IDF to be published. I think uh, personally, uh, but this is off record, that we could avoid Operation Protective Edge. Uh, but. We cannot get back in history. The milk was already spilled. Uh, but after this negotiation, uh, actually, in a way, in a way, uh, we recognized Hamas, not officially, and Hamas recognized Israel, not officially. And there is a terror entity there, and we are here in Israel. Uh, the PA and Hamas uh, in a huge struggle since then till today. Let's see what this year 2021 will bring the year of elections that Mahmoud Abbas declared. But the reality in Gaza did not change since then, okay? We implemented all the agreement between us and Hamas. Uh, since then, there were a few rounds, dozens of rounds of escalation uh, between Israel and Hamas. By the way, only last night, Hamas launched rockets to Be'er Sheva uh, to, uh, I don't know, to, to send a signal to Bibi Netanyahu, uh, if you are going to be elected, we know that you're in Be'er Sheva, and don't forget us, because we do not forget you, and we need to continue this negotiation, reality, dilemmas, I will, I will get to that later on, I will get to that, uh, because uh, what I will try and, uh, uh, and explain in this lecture is that in Gaza, we are facing a catch-22, that uh, Eventually, we will need all of us, all of us to solve it. All of us means we, the PA, Hamas, Egypt, uh, Qatar, uh, all the players will need to uh, solve this cash 22 reality. In the West Bank, we got back to the coordination, security coordination in, uh, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, the reality was changed dramatically, okay, in the West Bank, dramatically. Uh, rounds of uh, negotiation, uh, steps that were taken, uh, checkpoints that were uh, removed, uh, crossings, permits, uh, and the reality in the West Bank, the economical reality, the reality on the ground, the access and movement reality, everything was changed and the West Bank actually prospered uh, during uh, those years, uh, by the way, as of today, 2021, I'm a retired colonel from the IDF. I'm a consultant, as I told you, uh, in the biggest cement company. I have a Palestinian team that work with me. I have an office in Ramallah. I have a Palestinian car. I'm driving to Ramallah twice, uh, three times a, a week. Tomorrow, I'm going to be in Tulkarem visiting one of my clients with some Israeli uh, officials. And uh, Israel decided to support the economy and the change the reality in the West Bank. By the way, it's a message. It's also a message to the people. Uh, if you are not a terror organization, if you are not a terror entity, uh, the message to the people is that you also need to push your uh, governments uh, 
to choose the way of peace and not the way of terror because your reality will be changed. And if Israel can help you to change and to help you with this reality, Israel will do that. But if you are a terror entity, Israel has no motivation or not even obligation to change the reality uh, if you live under a terror entity. Uh, and it's a message, by the way, that uh, you know people talk about it. There are calls between Gazans and uh, people from the West Bank. It's not only calls, it's also people from Gaza that enter to Israel on a daily basis because people think usually that nobody is entering to Israel, but more than 7,000 people, no, sorry, 5,000 people every day enter from Gaza to Israel on a daily basis and uh, they see the reality. Uh, I want to move ahead a little bit and talk. Uh, I'm not going to enter to all the details. I just want to show you some of the things that I showed on the timeline. So this is the Gaza Strip. This is the northern border. There is a security fence and a, a small wall here in the Tiva Asara with the pedestrian crossing. It's called Erez. The 5,000 people that I mentioned are entering to Israel from here, from the north. The Gaza Strip is surrounded uh, with a security fence. By the way, actually three fences. One is an old fence that was built when we implemented Oslo. And then a new fence that was built after uh, understanding that uh, people can cross and enter. And uh, it's too dangerous to be so close to the border. And a third fence uh, was, that was built that was recently completed. It's an underground fence. It's a wall in some places down to 40 meters underground with one meter wide of a wall, of a cement, of a concrete wall with a lot of iron, with a lot of detectors to do what? To deal with only one threat is the threat of tunnels. This is a tunnel from the inside, okay? That is actually, that was a dig that Hamas dug from Gaza into Israel. Now, what I want you to understand it is this is the Gaza Strip, 365 square kilometers down to here. Around the Gaza Strip, there are more than 30 Kibbutzim and Moshavim and towns, okay, that are uh, of Israelis, more than 1 million Israelis that live around uh, what we say the Gaza envelope. There's only 1.2 kilometers from here, a town, it's called Zderot, that is uh, 1.2 kilometers uh, from the Gaza Strip. Now, I'm sure that you don't know, but the longest tunnel that we already found as Israelis, as the IDF, is four kilometers. So if the longest tunnel is four kilometers that we already, actually it's not we, it's the Egyptians that discovered the tunnel here on the border between Gaza and Egypt of that, that the length was four kilometers. So if they succeeded to do it here with four kilometers, we assume that they are able to do it here also, okay? From the Gaza Strip into Israeli Moshavim, Kibbutzim uh, uh, or town. Uh, again, 365 square kilometers of a border. It's surrounded with a wall, with the underground wall now to make sure that Hamas will not be able to use their strategic weapon in the tunnels. Uh, they have a natural border from the west. It's the Mediterranean. Palestinian fishermen can enter to the Mediterranean and catch fishes. It depends on times, on rockets, on escalations. But the longest distance that they uh, got recently, the fishing zone, uh, 50 miles inside uh, the Mediterranean. There are a lot of complaints is why Israel is not allowing them to move further inside because there are more fish inside. Uh, what I recommend to whoever says something like that is to read some researchers and uh, you will find out that more than two thirds of the fish in the Mediterranean vanished. And it doesn't matter if you fish 15 miles, three miles or four miles, it's the same amount of fish. So we offered them more than once, I did it personally, by the way, in some negotiation, is to build or, or to use farming. Uh, uh, aqua, I don't remember how uh, exactly it's called in English, but to grow fish uh, one kilometers from, uh, from the beach. Of course, Hamas refused uh, to such initiatives because a fishing zone is not only a real fishing zone to bring fish, a fishing zone is also something that symbols uh, uh, sovereignty, that this is, this, is, this, is, this is ours to have. 
but if they will uh, enter to this to those uh, initiatives to grow fish, they could produce something like uh, twenty to thirty thousand tons of fish uh, as a project, and they could save a lot of money to UNRWA, so they would put less protein in the food that they push into Gaza. Just I'm just trying to show you a circle of of what one initiative could help. Uh, uh, to the people of Gaza. Uh, there is a border between Gaza and Egypt, 13.8 kilometers. There is another crossing here between uh, Egypt and, uh, and Gaza. It's normally closed by the Egyptians since Sisi is in control in Egypt. And uh, only when the Egyptians decide that they will be, uh, it will be open, they open the crossing. So people uh, from Gaza uh, can fly anywhere that they want or, or drive anywhere that they want. It depends on the Egyptian mood. Here in the south, there is a huge Israeli crossing that was built by Israel. The commercial crossing is called Kerem Shalom. Uh, it was improved so uh, something like 1,000 trucks can bring goods on a daily basis uh, into Gaza. It's only back to back. I need, uh, I need to clarify that. And Israel supplies all the telecommunication needs into Gaza, internet, uh, phones, uh, and all of that. 10% of the water, 43% of the electricity. Uh, Hamas supply us rockets. They launch rockets from Gaza to Israel. They launched more than 30,000 rockets since 2001 till today. And Qatar, uh, an important uh, country that brings $30 million a, a month into Gaza, so Hamas would be able to pay salaries to uh, their officials, to help some families, and to pay money to the people that they sent to defense uh, during the year and two months of the riots uh, on defense. Saudi Arabia is another player, uh, but let's see and what will happen with the negotiation. I need to jump, unfortunately. Uh, I want to jump to this slide, the crisis in Gaza. Uh, we all expected that in 2020, uh, Gaza, actually I forgot to mention, in Gaza live 2.1 million people today, and we all expected that in 2020, 2.1 million people will be left without a drop of water. It will happen between 2020 to 2025. The aquifer is collapsing. The majority of the water that the people of Gaza use are from the underground water, the aquifer. Uh, and it's drying because of the droughts here in Israel. Uh, it's not being refilled. Israel supplies uh, water from the desalination plant that we have in Ashkelon to Gaza. We, Israel added after Protective Edge, another, after the operation Protective Edge, another 10 million meter cubic, 10 million meter cubic of water a, a, a year. Uh, we could add war, uh, more, but unfortunately, uh, the PA are refusing uh, that we would do that. You need to understand that whatever we supply to Gaza, whatever Israel supplies to Gaza, uh, somebody needs to pay for that. And the ones that are paying for that are actually the PA. How? It's uh, according to the Oslo agreement, we are collecting the revenues from the PA. It's something like 500 to 600 million shekels a month. And before we deliver the money to the PA in Ramallah, we deduct uh, for the services that we are supplying to Gaza. So if uh, there, is, there are some misunderstandings or a quarrel uh, between Hamas and Fatah, uh, automatically it impacts on the PA uh, decisions to tell us to stop deducting from their money for the services that we are supplying uh, to the Gaza Strip. But Israel uh, will, is not able to do something like that. So uh, in spite of the PA uh, demand to stop deducting from the money that we are deducting for the services in Gaza, we are actually doing it in a way by force and we continue supplying the water, the electricity and the, and the telecommunication to Gaza and we deduct from the money. So Israel, the government will be able to pay to the water company, to the IEC electricity company and to Bezek and, and other players. And uh, maybe some people do not like it, but what would you do? Would you keep 2.1 million people without those services? I think that nobody will be able to do something like that. 
but it's part of the challenges because if you use water, what you produce is sewage and what is happening to the sewage, it penetrates to the aquifer and it's been spilled to the Mediterranean. Now the movement of the Mediterranean is from south to north, it moves in circles. It takes sand, brings sand, takes sand, brings sand, takes sand, takes sewage and brings sewage. Where to? To Israel. What do we have here in Israel? The desalination plant that supplies the water to Gaza, but it's capable to deal with seawater, not with sewage. So the sewage is penetrated to the aquifer and pollutes it. And this is why the aquifer is about to collapse, but it also pollutes Israeli beaches and Israeli factories that supply the services to Gaza. So we are in a loop, actually, that we all need to solve those problems. But to solve the problems of the sewage, they need to have a country that will donate them to build a treatment plant. Now, to build a treatment plant, it's excellent, but they need electricity to operate it. So Israel is not able to supply electricity because nobody will sign on a commitment that will make sure that Hamas will not use this electricity to build more rockets or tunnels that they will continue launching into Israel. Um, and the PA are not ready to pay for the addition of the electricity. So we are stuck uh, in the middle. So by the way, a question that I will ask you to the end of this lecture, would you negotiate Hamas and try to reach to an understanding of a long-term ceasefire and for that, Israel will solve all the problems. Can Israel solve, solve the problems? Yes, of course. Just think about it. The West Bank. I will conclude from 2007 till today, and it's all about quality of life. So Israel changed all the reality in the West Bank of access and movement. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna clarify one thing here. There are crossings and there, there are checkpoints. Now, I'm not here to tell you what to think, but my definition to a checkpoint is inside the West Bank, between areas inside the West Bank. Uh, that's a checkpoint. A crossing is a crossing between the West Bank and Israel. Okay? To enter to Israel, you need to enter, you need to use a crossing. And to use the crossing, you need to get a permit from who you get the permit from the Israelis. And if you want to enter to Israel, the, Israel, the Israelis must check you that securely, uh, that you are not uh, booby trapped or, or you're not uh, uh, delivering money to some terror organizations or others. Some people do not accept what I'm saying and they see the crossing and the checkpoints as one thing. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is not how I think, but uh, I just, just wanted to put it as a point uh, because when we use numbers, so inside the West Bank, there are only two or three checkpoints normally open. But if you count the crossing, so of course the number will be much bigger. So it depends on your perspective of how do you think and, and, uh, and how do you want to see the situation. So Israel improved access and movement dramatically. Israel changed and uh, changed the economy dramatically from a, almost zero workers that work in Israel, we reached to a reality that more than 140,000 Palestinians work in Israel every day. It means it's a uh, workers, by the way, 80,000 are legal and the rest are of course illegal. Uh, so there is a security fence that surrounds the West Bank, but as you can understand from the illegal workers, they use holes in the fence, unfortunately. Uh, but those uh, 140,000 workers bring an income of 5.5 billion shekels a year to the Palestinian economy. Uh, infrastructure, a lot has been changed in the West Bank. Is that the best that Israel can do? No, we can do more. Uh, can we add more water? Yes. Can we add more electricity? Yes. Can we... Uh, 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 I don't know, uh, help them uh, uh, in, in area C, yes, of course, but it's a matter of uh, political, uh, not assumption, but a political uh, reality or a policy uh, that uh, is, that has to look to the future. Should we give everything now and then negotiate or should we first negotiate and get a better security uh, and, uh, and a better stability, uh, and, and, and only then Israel would give all the things. So 
I, would, I wanted to conclude the whole policy in the West Bank in one slide. So there is a quality of life by uh, improvement in access and movement, economy, infrastructure, civil coordination, a full one, and a lot of security coordination that all provides stability. Uh, stability to the people, stability to the economy, and stability uh, to the two governments. Uh, we have, I don't think that we have enough time to explain the map in the West Bank, but I need you just to understand that the map, this map, uh, this is the West Bank, uh, this is Jerusalem here, the Dead Sea, uh, Jenin in the north, Hebron in the south. The West Bank is surrounded with a security fence, uh, that is not completed to the end. This is the border between uh, the West Bank, Israel, and Jordan. On the other side is Jordan. Uh, I hope that next time you come to Israel and, uh, and visit here, uh, we will talk a lot about Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority, and why Jordan is so important uh, to Israel with the peace uh, agreement that we made. And I will conclude it with one sentence, Jordan provides Israel strategic debt. Uh, this strategic debt is important to Israel, to the Palestinians, to everybody, uh, and to the whole Middle East, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, the map that was created since Oslo divides the West Bank to three major areas, area A, area B, and area C. The majority of the cities are in area A and B, Palestinian cities. And all the settlements in the West Bank are in area C. And as you can see, area C is 63.2% of the area of the ground. In the uh, elections. This year, 2021, uh, Mahmoud Abbas declared that this is a year of elections. Hamas will participate in the elections uh, with the Fatah. The Fij, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, said that they are not going to take uh, a part on those elections. Uh, and, and, and the whole issue is actually preservation. Uh, on one hand, of who? Of Hamas or Fatah? And who is going to be the next president? The next Palestinian president? Now, when I say the next president, it's not only the president of the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. It's the president of the Palestinian uh, nation or entity. Uh, usually, usually people think that there are Palestinians only in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, let's talk a little bit about numbers. There are 2.4 billion Palestinians in the West Bank, 2.1 in Gaza, and the rest are in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Syria, in Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, the states in Europe, a total amount of 12.5 million Palestinians all over the world. So if you are the president, you are the president of 12.5 million Palestinians, and not only the president of Gaza or the West Bank. So there's a huge, huge strategical visioner fight between Hamas and Fatah, who is, what, what will be the identity of the next president, the day after. The day after is the day after Mahmoud Abbas. After Yasser Arafat, we knew that Mahmoud Abbas is going to be the successor. After Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, we don't know who is going to be the successor. Is it going to be Mahmoud, is it going to be Dakhlan? Is it going to be Barghouti? Is it going to be uh, Nabil uh, Shaat, Abu Ala, Ahmad Kra? Nobody, nobody knows. Uh, and let's see what will happen with the election. So the agenda, and, and, and there are actually three agendas. There is the agenda in the West Bank, there is the agenda in the Gaza Strip, and there is, let's say, like the unity government, the united agenda of the two entities. So in the West Bank, of course, what the, one of the most important things is the day after Mahmoud Abbas, the flow of funds, uh, there is a huge expectation now in the West Bank that because that the Biden administration will release the money that they stopped for the last four years. We are talking about something like 400 to 500 million dollars that they are expecting to get since June, July uh, this year. Uh, the incitement that unfortunately they continue in the West Bank, of course, the conflict over Area C, the Jordan Valley, 
Uh, those are the things that are very important in the West Bank. <clears throat> in the Gaza Strip, control and preservation in Gaza, Hamas, and this is something that I want you to understand, Hamas will never ever give up on this amazing achievement that they uh, actually got the Gaza Strip. It's the first time that uh, philosophy, a belief, an agenda, Hamas agenda, is connected to a ground, to a geographical piece of land. And, and so they will never give up on this huge, amazing achievement for them, that they are connected to a piece of land, and they are the sovereign entity there. A global recognition, the right of return uh, in the Gaza Strip. Of course, electricity and water and sewage, the crisis in Gaza, uh, this is it has a huge impact on uh, the reality in Gaza, uh, the, the life in Gaza, and of course the vision. Hamas's vision is that they will actually appoint the next president after Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and they will lead the PLO uh, as Hamas. Of course, what combines between the two entities is COVID-19. In Gaza, they succeeded to deal with that quite well, but now recently the numbers are jumping again in the West Bank. The reality is way much worse, but uh, Israel succeeded to uh, vaccine almost 200,000 Palestinians. Uh, vaccine, by the way, given by Israel, paid by Israel without uh, demanding money. Uh, all the workers that entered to Israel were vaccinated. Uh, uh, all the workers that entered to the settlements, to work in the settlements, something like 30,000 workers also got the vaccine. And now uh, uh, people who get permit to trade with Israelis and BMCs are getting this, uh, this vaccine uh, by Israel uh, because the two economies are connected. The unity government, the elections, uh, uh, the bo both parties are, are in a huge stance of what will happen in those elections. The reconciliation and the issue of prisoners. Uh, prisoners, this is an issue that uh, both sides, Hamas and Fatah, uh, uh, share the same interest to release and to free as more as possible. Jerusalem and the holy sites in any negotiation. And of course, BDS and boycotts Israel, it's something that is always on the table. Uh, and what will happen in the future? Unfortunately, even uh, experts way, way, way better than me cannot uh, expect or, or foresee what will be the reality between Israel and the Palestinians. And what I can tell you is that we still have a lot to do and a long way to, uh, to walk together till we reach to, uh, I don't know, peace, a new reality or something like that. Uh, I'm done with my presentation. If you want to move to questions, I'll be happy to. Yes, so... Um, um, let me see. Uh, so people can now ask questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, I, uh, the first question is already: How is it possible that um, after the changing situation with how the border is being controlled by Egypt now, by with Sisi, so the tunnels have been demolished as far as possible? How is it still possible that Hamas and other terror groups uh, in the Gaza Strip are possible to produce so many rockets? So, uh, yes, I said that uh, Assisi dealt with the tunnels, but uh, not all of them. Some of the tunnels still are being still operated by Hamas, and they continue smuggling weapons and, and, and other things uh, through Egypt, from Sudan, from Libya, and other places. Uh, and there is a, uh, what Hamas understood long time ago, and they, and they implemented those lessons, is that They've built underground uh, workshops, uh, factories that actually they produce uh, those rockets uh, with their own uh, technology that they, uh, during the years, succeeded to develop. Now, the materials are being smuggled, uh, some of them through Egypt, some of them through the tunnels, some of them officially, some of them from Israel. When it, uh, it's been entered to the Gaza Strip, uh, let's say a simple, a simple thing like pipes, they need pipes to fix the network inside Gaza, so, uh, or, or poles. So, so they can just take a pole, uh, uh, 
bring it to this uh, underground factory, use the technology that they have, and, and, and they have a rocket. And, and it's very simple to build a rocket. By the, way. the information is all over the internet. You can also find it yourself. So uh, another question is, um, somebody asked, are the Palestinian people in Gaza suffering from some kind of Stockholm syndrome? Uh, that they can be seen as hostages, taken hostage by Hamas, and that they, uh, even though they are hostage, they are identifying with their kidnappers. Hamas, look, Hamas have support in Gaza. It's not, it's not that they don't have support. Now, uh, on the other hand, e yes, I, I, I do agree to the, uh, to what, I, I don't remember the guy that asked the question, uh, uh, I, I do agree to the syndrome. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's exactly the syndrome, but, but you need to understand that people in Gaza are terrified. Uh, and nobody will dare and say something against Hamas. Nobody will dare and go and demonstrate against Hamas. Nobody will dare and do something against Hamas because he will be executed just like that. So 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 the reality is not that they feel that they are. Uh, 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 do have sympathy to the kidnapper. This is their reality. A terror organization that controls the Gaza Strip. Some of the people support Hamas, and the ones who do not support Hamas and believe that they should live differently are afraid to say something. And sometimes it's in the same family. So in the same family can somebody be an officer in Hamas and his brother is Fatah and he is against Hamas. So, so what, will, what will he do if he will do something? Uh, it, and uh, by the way, and I know about families that a brother arrested a brother that he was against uh, Hamas or against Shafiz or, or against other, other things. Now, you can ask me, how do I know that? As I told you, I have clients in Gaza. I have friends in Gaza. I'm the only IDF officer that was honored by a Palestinian family in the past. And there is a kid in Gaza called Grisha. I used to enter, by the way, once a year to give him a birthday present, escorted by Dahlan because I used to be the liaison officer to the Hlan's organization. Uh, I'm, I can also happily tell you that he's not in Gaza anymore. I made sure that he would leave the Gaza Strip. He's an engineer now in Abu Dhabi. Um, could you maybe tell something more about another major terror group uh, in the Gaza Strip, Islamic Jihad? Because if I remember correctly, in no November 2019, Israel neutralized one of its commanders, Baha Abu al Atta. And yeah, and then Islamic Jihad retaliated with a lot of rockets. <clears throat> uh, but Hamas did not join that fight, if I remember correctly. Hamas are playing the same game that Iran played. They have their proxies. So it was uh, good for Hamas that Israel killed Baha al Atta because uh, Israel actually served Hamas. Uh, because Baha al Atta made some huge problems to Hamas so sovereignty in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. But if you already asked this question, uh, let's, 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 let's clarify something. Ga the Gaza Strip has become an island of terror. Hamas is a terror entity that controls another 49 terror organizations in Gaza. It's Hamas. The second big one is Fij, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They get the money from Iran. They get the support from Iran. They are being trained by the Iranians. Hamas also, by the way. Uh, it's not only a uh, page, uh, but you have also Beit al Magdash, uh, and you have Al Mujahideen, and you have others. One of uh, one of the biggest problems that Egypt suffers in the Sinai uh, uh, Peninsula or, or island or Hatan Island is this connection between the uh, Daesh uh, or Shuhada al Quds with the support that they got through the tunnels with the Gaza, because in Gaza. They have a lot of, uh, for example, uh, uh, weapons, ammunition, hospitals, uh, you know, all the donations that they get from, uh, that they got from the United States, from the PA, from the EU, so they can treat all the people that are being injured by the Egyptians in Sinai. So, so, so one of the policies that Morsi implemented towards Gaza is to close the tunnels and the crossing, so he will push Hamas to the corner that they will not help all those terror organizations in Sinai, so they will stop attacking the Egyptians. So uh, the impact is not only about how many other terror organizations are in Gaza, it's also about the connection between Hamas and all other organizations with the uh, terror groups in Sinai. 
This is, by the way, also one of the reasons why Israel cannot just open the borders, because if Israel will open the borders, we will lose the strategic depth that is being provided by Egypt. The same thing that I mentioned with Jordan, by the way. Because it sounds very complicated to have all these terror groups uh, that may have different interests, different ideologies, uh, all together to keep them all in check in, uh, in such a small area. <clears throat> This is why Hamas are doing actually a great job. You know, uh, it's difficult to control other terror organizations. And what is happening to Hamas now is exactly what Hamas did uh, to the PA in the past. The Palestinian Authority, Fatah, controlled the Gaza Strip. And they also had to control Hamas as a terror group uh, playing, uh, excuse me for what I'm saying, between their legs, okay, launching motor shells and rockets into Israel. Now, I'm sorry, can you see me? Yes, we can uh, see you. I don't know what happened, but I see something now on the screen. And I can see you. Okay, well, from here it all looks fine in Zoom. Okay, now, now, now I'm back. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, now, the same thing is happening now to Hamas. They are the, actually the entity that controls the Gaza Strip, and they need to restrain another 49 terror organizations and actually do the same thing that the PA did to them in the past. And uh, I have to be honest and to say that they are doing a great job. And this is uh, one of the conflicts that Israel has to deal with should we eliminate Hamas or should the Hamas continue, or should we attack Hamas so bad that they will not be able to restrain the others? Or should we hit them only uh, a little bit? It will hurt them, but they will continue being as a major force in Gaza, so they will restrain other crazy guys that will have no policy or no interest and launch rockets without, I don't know, uh, without limits uh, into Israel. Or can somebody ask me a question? So, so if that's the reality in Gaza, why don't we enter and just uh, wipe them out? Can we do that? Yes, of course, Israel can, uh, can do that. Yeah, we use, I don't know, nine, 10 divisions. Uh, it will take Israel two weeks and we will uh, wipe them out. And, and then what? And then what? Should, uh, is that what Israel wants? To go back to Gaza and to implement, uh, I don't know, the, the occupation again? Uh, do we have enough money to uh, spend in Gaza? It, it, it will cost Israel something like 14 billion shekels a year to control the Gaza Strip. Okay, only with the uh, humanitarian needs. <clears throat> or maybe somebody will tell me, so do that, and the PA, Mahmoud Abbas, will get back to Gaza. So before somebody says that, you need to understand the culture. Mahmoud Abbas will never ride Israeli tanks back to Gaza, okay? So, so what, I was, what I was trying is actually to use the question that you just asked me and to reflect the reality in Gaza that we are facing a catch-22. Uh, somebody asks, um, although Hamas does not uh, <coughs> uh, officially uh, recognize Israel, it kind of does de facto because Israel is there um, and there are some deals that have been negotiated uh for the sake of the gaza strip um but it does not de jure uh, uh accept israel's right to exist is there any possibility for peace negotiations that hamas puts down its weapons stop being a terror organization is that feasible um it is feasible yes but i don't see that happening in the near future uh, what I what I want to what I want to clarify is, uh, is something else. Uh, there is a crisis in Gaza. Okay, they are entering to the biggest humanitarian crisis ever. Uh, would you allow to 2.1 million people to be left without a drop of water? I believe not. Would you uh, let 2.1 million people be left without electricity? I believe not. You know, today people in Gaza have only uh, eight to 10 hours of electricity a day. They need to build schools, clinics, and others. So 
you know what? Let me take the question that I was just asked and, and ask something else, if, if, I, if I may. Why don't we uh, start a direct negotiation with Hamas? You know what? Even not a direct, okay? Through mediators, like we do. <clears throat> and tell them, guys, we are going to, for free, we are going to pay for that. Supply all the water, all the electricity, <clears throat> solve all the economical problems. We will allow 60,000 Palestinian workers to enter to Israel on a daily basis from Gaza. And we will implement all your dreams uh, that the reality in Gaza will be changed. Everything will be pushed to Gaza, do whatever you want to do. And we all we, all we want is a, an agreement that for the next 20 years, okay, there will be a ceasefire, a long-term ceasefire, no more rockets, no more tunnels, and when we will reach the 20 years, we will negotiate again. Should we do that? Uh, if we do that, actually we recognize Hamas. It means we recognize the terror organization. It means we will send a message to the whole crazy guys all over the world that the only way to get something from a Western democracy is by rockets, is by force. Is that the message that the whole world would want us to send to uh, extremists? I'm not so sure. You know what? If we do that, actually we are recognizing, and this is what Hamas actually wants, we recognize them as an entity, as a terror entity. Uh, should we do that? I don't know. And let me make it a little bit more difficult. If we do that and start this negotiation, who is going to be very, very upset and angry? The president, because Mahmoud Abbas is still the president. Yes, there are two different governments, but he is the president. So if we will do that directly with his enemies as of today, he will be very upset and he will not accept that. So maybe we will solve the problem with Gaza, but we will start a problem in the West Bank. And actually we will impact on uh, who will be the figure that will be the day after. Is that what we want to do to interfere? Uh, so, so, so there are no easy solutions. There are no easy uh, ways to solve the problem. Whatever you do, you make somebody, you piss somebody. Uh, and uh, you need to take your chances and to decide what you want to do. So the best thing that, will, that, that we can expect that will happen is that there will be a reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah, that they will establish a unity government, that there will be one government that we will negotiate. If you ask me prof personally, not, pro not professionally, personally, I think it's about time we start or we accept Hamas and, and we tell Mahmoud Abbas officially, uh, uh, join them and, and do whatever you want to do. We will want to deal with one entity because you cannot reach to peace or to agreement with one Palestinian entity without having the, ex the agreement of the other one. So, so we need one entity. By the way, the biggest obstacle now is that we are dealing with two Palestinian entities. If there would be one entity, I believe that we will be able to reach to some understanding. And could uh, the upcoming Palestinian elections help with that? Uh, I believe that yes, uh, it will. It will. Uh, it's a step towards uh, this solution. It's a step towards uh, a reality that there will be in the future one Palestinian entity. But, but, the, let's say that Hamas will win the elections. Uh, they all already did that in Gaza, and, and and what was the outcome that they conquered the Gaza Strip? and they became a terror entity. Uh, will the same thing happen in the West Bank? Should we take the risk that they will win the election in the West Bank and the West Bank will become uh, a terror entity as the Gaza Strip? Uh, we, we, we already have, uh, uh, we, we have a good example, okay? It's already happened. We don't need to assume that something like that will happen, will maybe happen. We see what happened after the election in 2006. So one of the biggest problems would be if Hamas will win those elections, what will be Israel's response? Or will Hamas will declare that they are laying their weapons down and they are not a terror entity? It, 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 it really depends on them. We have a question from the audience. Um, is it possible, even in the greatest circumstances, let's say there's peace and everything, is it possible for 2.1 million people to live prosperously in, in Gaza, which is such a small area? 
Uh, yes, uh, they can. I can give you an example of Singapore, for example. Uh, if you invest your efforts and your money and your will in prosperity, in economy, and not in tunnels, in rockets, in weapons, in snipers, in seals, in commando, in uh, smuggling, in technology, in drones, yes, of course you can. By the way, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because uh, uh, we are talking only about a small piece of land of 365 square kilometers, and in the future it will not be enough, but there are solutions to that also. Uh, by the way, you are the greatest country in the world, a nation that showed the whole world how to expand uh, inside the sea, inside the inside water. So, so the same thing can be done in Gaza, or uh, to or to Egypt. It all it, it really depends on on, on them, what uh, uh, where they want to channel their efforts. Uh, another question from the audience, is there any role for the current Biden administration, so the United States government, or the European Union to act as a negotiator for Hamas uh, to improve the conditions of the Gaza Strip? I believe that the Biden administration is already uh, on, on the way to improve the situation in Gaza. Uh, uh, their policy is very, very clear when it comes to Palestinians. It's totally different than Trump's administration. Uh, on the other hand, this is me personally. I believe that they are doing a huge mistake. Uh, when uh, you know it's the Middle East. In, in the Middle East, they speak Arabic. Uh, uh, it's a different culture. It's a, it's a different understanding. And and uh, you cannot show you cannot you you cannot show weakness. And some of the things that unfortunately Biden's administration is doing is uh, they are showing again. When, when people in the West Bank see that, uh, not when people in the Middle East look at it and see that, they translate it as weakness. And weakness never helps somebody in the Middle East, unfortunately. I, ha I believe they have good attentions. Because what, what did you think, because you mentioned it, uh, the Trump administration, the previous American administration uh, released a peace plan, a proposal, uh, which is quite different from previous proposals, um, but it was outright rejected by the Palestinians. But uh, what is your uh, perspective on that proposal? Can you uh, can you ask it again? I, I, I need to clarify the question, if you don't mind. So what is your perspective on the peace proposal by the Trump administration? the so-called deal of the century oh, the, the Abraham Accord yes well but, but the towards the Palestinians well the uh, Abraham Accord uh, helped help a lot uh, to Israel and to some uh, Muslim countries it was an eye in the finger okay to the Palestinians uh, because it, there was a uh, and a strategy that was built by the Palestinians that the way to peace, okay, between Israel and Arab countries would be through the Palestinians. And uh, the Trump administration and Bibi and Netanyahu showed uh, the whole world that there is a possibility to peace between Israel and Muslim and other Muslim Arab countries, and it doesn't mean that it should go through the Palestinians. And if Israel will do this uh, Abraham Accord and the peace, actually the Palestinians will be able to join it later on in the future when Israel and uh, Palestinians will reach understandings. Now things are uh, about to change. And I believe that the Biden administration will actually go back to the traditional uh, 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 formula is that the way that Israel will continue making peace with other countries, it would be only through the Palestinians. And I believe that Saudi Arabia would be one of the countries to prove that. This is, I believe, one of the reasons. But again, we are not here to talk about Saudi Arabia and other countries. But uh, I believe that this is one of the one of the reasons why Israel, why the US, the US administration now uh, implementing some sanctions uh, against Saudi Arabia. By the way, the closest allies uh, uh, in the Middle East and uh, I believe that they are trying to cook and to boil something here, something new. Another question from the audience. Uh, what is the role of Iran 
with regard to the policy Hamas uh, dictates? Uh, this is a total different lecture. Uh, if we want, we will do it in the future. But but I will I will I will, I will respond like uh, like that. Uh, Iran is a very sophisticated, smart country with a very clear policy that they that they have for the last 25 years. Uh, they are to expand and their strategy is very simple is that they have proxies all over. By the way, if we just look uh, on our borders, you can see that they have Hezbollah on our northern border. They are trying to establish themselves in Syria on, uh, on another border. They already have some uh, fingers in Gaza by Fij and Iran. Uh, they are uh, giving money and operating the Houts in Yemen. Uh, there is a huge uh, threat that they will enter to Jordan. And they show themselves uh, like they are clean. It's not them, but the proxies are always doing the job for Iran, always. Uh, and they have no problem to sacrifice all their proxies. And this is uh, uh, a policy and a strategy that is very pain for Iran. Actually, I have to flatter them doing a great job. And this is unfortunately what I believe, again, me personally, uh, the Biden's administration do not understand that, uh, or they do understand, but they want to attack it differently. I don't know. But it has a huge impact, a huge impact on us, on our borders, on uh, and, and actually, what the Palestinians need also to understand that we and the Palestinians have a common enemy, and it's Iran. First of all, they are Shia and not Sunnah, and secondly, if they will have their nuclear abilities and they will attack us, actually, they will attack us and the Palestinians because we live in the same in the same uh, neighborhood. Another question from the audience. Um... Do you think uh, finding a solution for the situation in Lebanon, where Hezbollah is in power, would that be a prerequisite for building towards peace between Israel and the Palestinians? <clears throat> I think that there is no... Uh, there is a connection between uh, Lebanon and uh, solution there uh, uh, and Israel, but... Uh, I think that uh, we are dreaming that uh, there would be a solution in Lebanon. Yes, I'm aware of the reality in Lebanon. I'm aware of the economical crisis. I'm aware of the Hezbollah influence in the government, in the country. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of the refugee camps, Palestinian refugee camps. I'm aware of the fact that Salah Al-Aruri is uh, um, Hania's deputy and he lives in Lebanon and there are refugee camps. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Lebanon is Lebanon. Uh, it's a total different game. This is how Lebanon looks like from 72 with the civil war. It will continue uh, with their problems. And what is happening in Lebanon will stay in Lebanon. It will not impact on what is happening between us and the Palestinians. It's two different arenas. Another question from the audience. Um, how do Arab Israelis relate to the people in Gaza and the West Bank? How do they look at both Hamas and the Palestinian Authority? And could they perhaps even play a role in reaching an understanding? I think that the outcomes of, of the elections from yesterday are actually the answer. The Arab uh, party uh, that uh, everybody thought the Arab party, the new one, it's called Ram, the pragmatic one that is ready also to sit with Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, people were sure yesterday, last night, that they are going to vanish on the political map. And actually, they got five mandates till now. It means Arab Israelis do not care, 50% of them now do not care about what will happen to Israel and the Palestinians. And all they care is that the reality between Israelis and Arabs in Israel uh, will change and they would feel more Israelis, more equal, more part of Israel. Uh, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a fact that 50% of Arab Israelis are tired from their leaders saying that we need to solve the Palestinian problem, we need to solve the Palestinian problem. They don't want to hear about it. All they want is to solve their own problems and their own reality. And the elections and the outcomes of the, the first outcomes are actually a good answer to this wonderful question, by the way.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Grisha Jakubovic. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, this was so much for, your, for the opportunity. Voor het publiek thuis, dit was alweer de laatste lezing van de CD informatiereeks uh, Heeft u de eerdere lezingen gemist of wilt u die gewoon terugkijken? Dat kan op de verschillende CD kanalen, bijvoorbeeld op ons YouTube kanaal CD TV. Uh, alle kijkers, bedankt voor het kijken, bedankt voor het meedoen aan de informatiereeks. Uh, heeft u ervan genoten en wilt u het steunen? Uh, dat kan op verschillende manieren. Informatie hierover kunt u vinden op de CD website cd.nl. En dan is er nog een laatste ding, uh, de tip van Amin. Uh, Amin Abu Rashed, een beruchte Hamas fondsenwerver hier in Nederland. Uh, hij heeft ons erop gewezen dat er nu heerlijke dadels uit Israël te koop zijn bij de Albert Heijn. Dus uh, tip van Amin, uh, ga dadels kopen. En dan wens ik iedereen nog een fijne dag. En thank you once again, Grisha Jakubovic. Thank you, thank you very much.